If you're studying for the INBDE, I highly recommend INBDE Bootcamp, an all-in-one study resource that will help you pass your exam. Use coupon code MENTALDENTAL for 10% off. Hey everyone, Dr. Ryan here, and welcome back to our biostatistics series. In this video, I'm going to talk about research bias, the ways in which our findings might be skewed one way or another due to some factors we may or may not have considered in our research design. So research bias refers to systematic errors in the design, conduct, analysis, or interpretation of a study that led to incorrect or misleading conclusions. Bias can affect the validity and reliability of research findings, potentially skewing results in a particular direction. So it's really important to try to limit it wherever possible, or if we can't minimize bias, at least acknowledge it in the discussion section of our research paper. First, we're going to talk about research bias that occurs before the actual study is conducted. That would be during the recruitment of the participants or subjects. Selection bias is when the participants selected in the study do not accurately represent the target population. And there's two examples of this, sampling bias and attrition bias. So sampling bias is where certain members of the intended population are less likely to be included than others. For example, consider a survey of high school students. That would be our sample to measure the usage of illegal drugs in teenagers, which would be our target population. This will be a naturally biased sample because it does not include homeschooled students or high school dropouts. So high school students, the sample that she picked is not fully representative of the target population of teenagers. So this was a bias rooted in our sampling method. Here's another example. Let's say we conduct a study in a hospital because there's a lot of patients concentrated there. It's easy to find them. By the way, this is referred to as Berkson's fallacy, that a study sample selected from hospitals is generally less healthy than the overall population. So if that's the kind of sample we're using, our results will be skewed in that direction. And attrition bias is where participants may have been sampled in a representative way, but this bias means that the subjects who drop out of the study are systematically different than the ones who remain in the study. For example, non-compliant orthodontic patients might drop out of a study, leaving the compliant patients in the study skewing your results toward treatment efficiency. If I'm researching the effectiveness of rubber band wear, and all the patients who wore their rubber bands really well and complied with treatment stayed in the study and the ones who didn't dropped out, then wow, it's gonna look like rubber bands really work, maybe more so than if we had the sample remain that truly represented the population. Sadly, mortality can also factor into attrition bias. For instance, if you're looking at a sample of cancer patients receiving a chemotherapeutic agent, to assess its efficacy, some of those subjects might drop out of the study because they sadly pass away during the course of that study. Next, let's talk about research bias that comes into play during the study itself, and that would be during the collection of data phase. So response bias is up first, and this is when a person selects an answer to a question that is not honest it's intentionally or unintentionally incorrect. So social desirability bias is the first type of response bias, and it's also the most common response bias that occurs when survey respondents provide answers according to society's expectations rather than their own beliefs or experiences. This could be something personal like HIV status, for example. This is the subject knowingly choosing a different answer because they are perhaps uncomfortable recording the honest answer. And then recall bias happens 
when participants are not able to accurately recall information. So this is when they unknowingly provide a wrong answer. Observational studies that rely on self-reporting past events are particularly prone to this type of bias. In other words, retrospective studies that look in the past are particularly prone to recall bias. And I remember RE for retro, RE for recall. Now, how do we reduce this type of bias? It seems like this could be avoidable. And how we do it is we shorten the recall period, meaning we ask participants about their dietary habits in the past week rather than over the past year. Next up is measurement bias, and this is simply due to poorly measuring the data during the study. For example, let's say your team's portable machine to measure hemoglobin starts to malfunction, and it hasn't been checked routinely as it should be every day, and so it was measuring everyone's hemoglobin as 0.3 grams per liter too high. So if that's the case, that would lead to an underestimation of the prevalence of anemia because the readings would always overestimate the hemoglobin for everyone measured by that machine. So just that one mistake could have a profound effect on distorting your findings away from the truth. Observer bias is when participants know they are being monitored and so they act differently than they would under normal circumstances, leading to biased or skewed results. This is also known as the Hawthorne effect. And then lastly, we have expectation bias, which is also sometimes confusingly called observer expectancy bias, not to be confused with plain observer bias. But anyway, expectation, but anyway, expectation bias is when a researcher's preconceived beliefs about the efficacy of a treatment changes the outcome of that treatment. For example, if the researcher expects the treatment group that's getting this brand new medication is going to show promising signs of recovery, they are more likely to document positive outcomes because that's what they expect will happen. So if the researcher knows the control group is getting a placebo, which is a fake medication on the other hand, they're more likely to document no change because that's what they already expect is going to happen. So the strategy to reduce this bias is to utilize blinding. Blinding means that the researcher doesn't know what group gets the treatment and which one gets the placebo. They're blinded to that information, so it doesn't affect their data collection. By the way, if neither the researchers nor the subjects know what group they've been assigned to, that is known as double blinding a very strong research methodology. And lastly, let's talk about research bias that can come into play after the study is over. That would be during the interpretation of the results. First up, we have confounding bias. This is when you have a factor that's related to both the exposure and the outcome, but it's not a causative factor. So this is where our confounders or confounding variables come into effect. For example, pulmonary disease is more likely in coal workers than the general population, but coal workers are also more likely to smoke than the general population. So we think we've proven a point, but actually it wasn't spending time in the coal mine that was causing COPD. It was their recreational tobacco smoking that was increasing the prevalence of COPD in that particular population. Now, how do we reduce this type of bias? Well, it comes down to randomization. So randomizing helps to spread out any potential confounding variables among the different study groups and thereby reduces the chance that any one contributing factor that we may not have known about at the beginning gets piled into just one of those groups. So randomization is the key to reducing confounding bias. Publication bias is defined as the failure to publish results of a study on the basis of the direction or strength of the study findings. So unfortunately, weaker 
or boring results are less likely to be published in a peer-reviewed journal, even though they may very well be important. And honestly, some of the most important studies are those that find no correlation or no statistical significance, but unfortunately, sometimes those are the papers that are left out of the publication cycle. And lastly, lead time bias and length time bias are two types of biases that can affect the data interpretation of studies, especially in the context of disease detection and treatment. And they are often confused with one another, and frankly, they're pretty complex. So I want to review them both separately and carefully. So first is lead time bias. This occurs when earlier detection of a disease, typically through screening, is confused with an increased survival time, even though the earlier detection does not actually change the natural course of the disease. When a disease like cancer is detected earlier, the time from diagnosis to death seems longer, but this does not necessarily mean that the patient's overall life expectancy is increased. It only means that the time between detection and death is extended. So let me show you this scenario that I created here. Let's say a patient develops cancer at age 55, but they don't have any symptoms. So without screening, which is the top line here, the cancer is not diagnosed until age 60 when symptoms appear and then the patient dies at age 65, giving a perceived survival time of five years from detection via symptoms to death of the patient. Now, with screening, that's the bottom arrow here, the cancer is detected at age 55, but the patient still dies at age 65. So the measured survival time now from diagnosis via screening to death of the patient is now 10 years, but the actual survival time has not changed. The disease naturally progresses from the green color to the red color. So the earlier detection gave a false impression of longer survival time due to lead time bias. So the lead time for this patient in this scenario is the five-year period between detection via screening and diagnosis via symptoms. So the question becomes, how do we reduce this type of bias? So what we do is we adjust survival rates depending on the severity of the disease at the time of diagnosis. So let's say we're in the top example, no screening, so we detect the disease here when symptoms appear, and they're already in the yellow of this natural progression of disease. So we can estimate from that point that they've probably already been with this condition for the last five years or whatever that period of time is that we adjust for based on the severity of disease at the time of diagnosis. And finally, we have length time bias. This one is, frankly, a little bit more complicated, but don't worry, I promise that we'll get it. It's the tendency of screening programs to disproportionately detect slower progressing, less aggressive cases of disease. And this makes the screening seem more effective than it actually is. Basically, the slower growing diseases are present for a longer period of time without symptoms, making them less likely to be detected by symptoms and more likely to be detected by periodic screenings. Faster growing diseases, on the other hand, which progress quickly to the symptomatic stages, are less likely to be detected during routine screenings and are more likely to be diagnosed after symptoms appear. This bias leads to the misconception that the screening is catching diseases earlier and improving survival rates, when in reality, it's simply detecting the more slow progressing cases, which naturally have better prognoses. 
So let's take a closer look at this new scenario here. It's similar but slightly different than the last scenario that I made. So let's say we have two patients here, one who gets oral squamous cell carcinoma at age 55 and the other who gets it at age 50. The first patient has a fast progressing tumor with a worse prognosis, while the second patient has a slow progressing tumor with a better prognosis. An oral cancer screening program that's done every few years, which is represented by these gray bars, is more likely to detect the slow growing tumor because there's simply a bigger window of time. You can see that two of the routine screenings completely missed the aggressive tumor. So if we compile data of cancer cases detected from symptoms only, we're gonna be skewed towards the fast progressing aggressive tumors and their survival time, the average survival time, is going to be skewed lower. Whereas if we compile data of cancer cases detected from symptoms and screenings, well now the average survival time is going to be skewed higher. So this bias can make it appear as though screening itself is helping people survive longer. But in reality, it's just catching the more slowly progressing tumors. So in summary, lead time bias is the overestimation of survival duration due to earlier detection by screening, whereas length time bias is also overestimation of survival duration, but due to the relative excess of cases detected that are slowly progressing. So the key mnemonic to use here is that lead time bias is due to early detection. Remember the D in lead is for D in detection, whereas length time bias, remember the G in length is for slowly progressing, G and G for progressing. So again, D for detection and G for progression. So hopefully that helps to clarify those difficult types of biases as well as the other research biases that are possible before, during, and after your research is conducted. That's it for this video lecture. Thank you so much for watching. I genuinely appreciate it. I'd also really appreciate if you consider clicking that like button below this video, subscribing to the channel if you have not already, sharing this video with your friends, and leaving a comment below letting me know what you thought. All of those things can really help to grow the channel. If you wanna go above and beyond supporting me and what I do here, please check out the Patreon page linked below. If you wanna join there, you'll get access to exclusive practice questions, exclusive study guides, a Discord server, and so, so much more. And if you see at the end of my videos, I have an end credits screen, and all of those names there are the names of my amazing Patreon supporters that I'm honored to have. Thank you again for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.